We are going to learn about quantum computers today. Uh, my name is Eneko Aspe. I'm the uh, Sales Enablement Manager at Sandbox AQ. And today we have Stefan like an hour with us. He is a physicist and the VP of Engineering at Sandbox AQ. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Eneko. Uh, we're going to start talking about uh, how these quantum computers operate. They, they do it using uh, qubits and we can get qubits in different manners, in different ways. So we're going to talk about those. So the first one, probably the most popular one, is the uh, supercondu superconducting quantum computers. So basically, this is a type of qubit that uses uh, synthetic qubits uh, built uh, using super cool circuits. And they are made of uh, metals like aluminum, for example. And what it means to be super con superconducting is that there is no resistance. So there is no energy loss from resistance. Because uh, something very important for qubits uh, is the quantum coherence. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what quantum coherence is and why it's so important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's certainly a very important topic. So I mentioned before, when we talked about qubits, right, qubits, you know, could be in a zero or a one or some kind of zero plus one, zero minus one kind of state. Um, and there, are, and when you have multiple qubits, there are many, many interesting kinds of combinations, very quantum type states that have, uh, that we don't have any classical intuition for. And those are the things you want to take advantage of. The problem is those kinds of special quantum states that have special quantum properties are very fragile. Um, you know, if, if you, uh, that's why we don't notice, you know, there, we don't notice quantum effects say in, in the rooms that we're sitting in because, there's a lot of there's a lot of random stuff happening. There's a lot of air molecules hitting us all the time. There's stray beams of light coming in, interfering with what might have otherwise been quantum effects. And so the coherence or and coherence times measure the um, the resilience of a particular uh, of a particular quantum system, um, the ability for it to maintain its quantum status, right? Because eventually something's going to go wrong and it'll lose track of its quantum nature and then it won't be useful for computing anymore. So let me see if I understood this. So is, imagine I have like a little flower, let's say, that is very fragile and we are in the middle of a hurricane and a big storm is coming and the coherence will be how long could I keep that flower alive? Something like that? Yeah, exactly. Or maybe how long the flower keeps its petals. Right. Got you. Before, okay. before the hurricane starts to rip them off. <laughs> All right. Understood. It's a little bit violent, but, but, uh, <laughs> but I think that's the idea. All right. And then in this type of, of quantum computers, superconducting uh, quantum computers, uh, good thing uh, is that we have high gate speeds and fidelities. And they can also use standards, so uh, processes that we already use, uh, like lithography, for example. Um, what does it mean to have high gate speeds and fidelities? Because I know that these are very two important properties in quantum computers, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. So what a gate is, first of all, is it's an operation that you would want to do to manipulate your qubits. So in ordinary computing, you've got all your zeros and ones, but the zeros and ones are useful because you have things you can do to change a zero into a one and a one into a zero, and you perform these kinds of operations in a particular order, in a particular pattern, and the result is something useful, right? And in quantum computing, it's a very similar kind of story. You have some things you can do to your zeros and your ones, and your zero plus ones and your zero minus ones, in order to get something useful uh, at the end. And the basic operations that you build up your quantum programs with, these are called quantum gates. Right, so these are the things that you do to your qubits. And so if you're building your qubits out of, say, superconducting wires, uh, then there are certain things you can do to enact these quantum gates or these, these gates to the qubits. And um, you only have a certain amount of time to run your quantum program, right? The coherence time. As soon as if you if you run out of coherence, then then the the, you can't do quant interesting quantum things anymore. And so having a high gate speed means that you're able to do a lot of operations before the system loses coherence, before it stops being quantum. And so that's an advantage. 
Um, you want to have a long coherence time and also a short, uh, a, a short gate time or a high gate speed. So you can fit a lot of operations in there. And then fidelities, what does it mean to say you've got good fidelities? Well, when you're doing these operations, right, these quantum gates, um, you may not get it exactly right. You know, the, 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 you might make a mistake uh, because these things are not easy to implement. And doing it, uh, getting it exactly right or getting it exactly right a large, you know, fraction of the time, you get it right more often than you get it wrong, that means you have high fidelity. So high fidelity means you're doing the operations correctly and high gate speed means you're doing them quickly. So uh, if I have this flower in the middle of the hurricane, how fast I feed with this flower a pea, let's say, for example, uh, that will be the gate speed. And the fidelity will be how good, let's say, is the quality of my flower, right? Or something like that. Like how beautiful is my flower will be the fidelity. The gate speed will be how many bees can I feed with this flower? And then how long the uh, flower leaves will be the quantum coherence, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So if you've got several of these flowers and you've got bees flying between them, you might think of this as, yeah, how many bees do you have? How, um, how fast are they moving? How healthy are they? And in order to be able to uh, sort of affect some kind of communication between the flowers. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, and then that is something good of these uh, quantum computers that they have high gate speeds and fidelities. Something bad is that they have uh, short coherent times. Also, uh, we need to keep them uh, in cry cryogenic uh, cooling, meaning that this is very costly as well. And then um, some microwave interconnect frequencies are not uh, understood yet. However, there are many players uh, using this type of uh, quantum computers, some of them uh, very well known, as you can see in the uh, slide. Um, do you think that this is a type of quantum computer that, that has an important future ahead? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think, I think this kind of quantum computer, the superconducting quantum computer, certainly has several advantages and there's a reason why so many big players are putting you know putting bets in this direction um, and it's also important to keep in mind that it's not it's likely not going to be a winner take all kind of situation when it comes to quantum computing there could be even if we fast forward into the far future there could be use cases for different kinds of different kinds of qubits working together in some kind of larger systems because each qubit has different pros and different cons. And so there may be some situations where one kind of qubit is preferred, some situations where another kind of qubit is preferred. But superconducting qubits are definitely one of the, at least today, um, you know, most, most would say that they're the sort of the, uh, the forerunner right now. A second type of quantum computers that is really important is the trapped ions. Uh, ions are natural qubits. This means that all of them are identical in parameters and performance, which is good. Um, of course, that gives you uh, like some consistency, let's say. Um, these ions are trapped in a uh, magneto-optical trap, MOT, and manipulated to apply uh, gates across two qubits. So something good about these uh, trapped ions quantum computers is that they also, as well as the superconducting uh, quantum computers, they have high gate fidelities. But in this case, uh, we also have long coherence times. Uh, and we don't need uh, to put this in a fridge. Uh, however, the uh, gate times, the gate operations are slow. And they also talk about some issues with the uh, scalability. Um, any comments on the uh, trap ions uh, quantum computers? Yeah, trapped ions are in some cases the original quantum, in some ways the original quantum computers. These were systems that people started to understand and do these kinds of initial, you know, just a couple of qubits at a time back hmm. in the 90s. So this was, and, this was the first type of quantum computer was trapped ion computers, right? Well, I mean, some people might uh, argue about what was first and when, when you really have a quantum computer or not a quantum computer, but these were definitely one of the first. Got you. Um, and the, um, it's one thing that's interesting is, you know, if you, look at, if you look at the trapped ions, you see that they have long coherence but slow gate times, right? And in superconducting, we had short coherence but 
fast gate times. And it, that, that's not a coincidence. There's a trade-off in these kinds of situations usually where systems that naturally have longer coherence also tend to be ones where it's where the gates happen to be a little bit slower. Um, there's and there's a reason for that. It comes down to like the same kinds of physical effects. So this is what I was saying before: how there's not just one clear winner in every category. If you make a list of all the things you would want from a quantum computer, there are there are trade-offs, and different kinds of systems have have different uh, you know have different strengths and different weaknesses. That's so why we room. have, I guess, investment in in these different types of uh, quantum That's computers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's it's good it's good that the the world as a whole, the whole community, mm -hmm. is looking at different kinds of modalities, uh, because you know there are, there are different strengths and weaknesses of each one. Mm -hmm. Then we also have the uh, neutral atoms quantum computers. So uh, obviously, as they are neutral, they are electrically neutral and can be packed tightly uh, without repelling. Um, lasers send the atoms into a very uh, particular state. I would love to know more about this, the Rydberg state, uh, and they couple to each other. Um, and that's the way they create entanglement between atoms. So we have quantum entanglement here. Uh, you can have an analog control uh, to manipulate them. And good things uh, about the neutral atoms is that uh, they are perfect and consistent. So this gives you a, a strong connectivity. Again, long coherence times. Um, the only problem or so, some of the problems are that uh, it requires high uh, vacuum, so ultra high vacuum, that's very costly again. And there is a problem with the scaling because the, uh, how, the, how do we apply the lasers can be problematic in terms of scaling them up. Um, we also have some uh, players uh, trying to push this type of quantum computers ahead. Um, so yeah, what is exactly, how, how do they exactly work, the uh, neutral atoms uh, quantum computers? Yeah. So the nice thing about neutral atom quantum computers, as well as trapped ion quantum computers, if you ask somebody about, you know, what what makes those two really nice, it's that your the building blocks fundamentally are these atoms, right? In the case of ion trapped ion quantum computers, it's atoms with a net charge. That's what an ion is, and in the case of neutral atom quantum computers, it's atoms without a net charge, um, and. The nice thing about atoms is that every atom is, you know, every atom of a certain type is identical, right? So there's no manufacturing defects uh, even possible, just because nature makes them all the same, and that's that's one of the advantages here. The neat thing about neutral atoms, unlike the trapped ions, is that because they're neutral, indeed, you can pack a lot of them together. Um, then the problem becomes how do you get them to talk to each other because they don't, you know, they don't interact, and that's where this Rydberg state thing comes in, which is which is. Um, very interesting, right? So normally when you think about an atom, you've got the nucleus and then you've got the electrons going around the nucleus, right? And usually the electrons are very close to the nucleus. Uh, but what a Rydberg state is, is what happens when you, if you hit the atom just right with, with say a laser, then you can have an electron. You don't knock it free completely to turn the atom into an ion, but you, you, you energize it so that it's much further away from the nucleus than it normally is. And then so they can talk the, so they can talk to other atoms. That's right. So now if you've got if you've got the nucleus and the if you've got the nucleus and the electron separated, then the electron has a charge and the nucleus has a charge. And if they're far away from each other, then you know the, the whole thing is still neutral because you've got say positive and negative. But when they're separated from each other, then you have a large what's called electric dipole moment. That's when you have positive and negative charge that are separate from each other. And if you do that, if you have two atoms that are neutral, but in this Rydberg state, then you've got these two very large electric dipole moments, and there can be an interaction uh, based on the existence of those large dipole moments, which are not normally there. And the, and the difficult thing is to use these lasers to do that and scale that up. That's right. That's right. So there's, there's a significant amount of very sophisticated laser control that has to happen, but they're making some really... Uh, really exciting progress and the neutral atoms are much more what they're something that's more recent than than uh, these trapped ion quantum computers for example um, 
but uh, but they're making they're making some really exciting progress uh, in 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 the recent years. Interesting. We will keep an eye. Um, let's move on. We have two more types of quantum computers. Um, the uh, photonic quantum computers use a state of light, so photons, as qubits. Uh, photons are easy to produce, but the problem is that they can be trapped at least easily <laughs> uh, to create entanglement between many photons. So that is uh, the difficult part. Uh, computers, uh, in this case, they use measurement-based computation rather than the traditional gate-based computation we were talking about before. Uh, they, are, they have extremely fast gate speeds. Uh, they don't need a fridge or vacuums, and they have a very small overall footprint. But the problem is the uh, noise. So noise uh, uh, coming from the uh, photon loss uh, is a problem. And then the two uh, Q gate uh, challenges uh, they have also. So photons, uh, they don't naturally interact. Um, what do you think about uh, photonic quantum computers? Yeah, photonic quantum computers is very, um, you know, the, the, the really nice thing about photonic quantum computers is that is this idea that, yes, you can make photons very easily. You know, if we talk about one day needing millions of qubits, right, it's going to it's, it's quite a challenge to make millions of superconducting circuits that are all quite that are all exactly right. It's a challenge to because have you, because you need to atoms. fabricate them one by one. Yeah, yeah. And it's a challenge to have a million atoms, whether they're neutral atoms or trapped ions you know, sitting in the right spot and have lasers attached to them all. Um, but it's very easy to make a million photons. And so the scale, when it comes to scaling, it seems like the photons, it's, it's very tempting to say, okay, to solve the scale problem, let me just try to use photons. Um, but yes, the real, the real challenge here is that photons, it's very hard to get them to interact with each other. So the, the, the whole model, right? of computing with photons is typically very different. Rather than trying to take two photons and make them interact, you know, and, and do like a two qubit gate uh, every time you need to do a two qubit gate, that's not the way people think about a photonic quantum computer at all. Instead, it's this measurement-based computation. What this means is essentially, you know, simplifying a little bit. It means setting up a big quantum state that has a lot of entanglement between many, many photons. And you do that, you know, it doesn't even matter what kind of computation you're going to do later. You just have a bunch of photons in a very, a very large, very entangled quantum state. And then you take that entangled quantum state and you do operations to it, and including, um, including measurement operations where you measure and then depending on the outcome of the measurement, you do something else to a different part of the state and you proceed in that way. And you can show it's possible to show that that kind of procedure can do any kind of computation in the same way as uh, the usual procedure that people think about where you just do a bunch of gates in a row. Um, so the problem but, here is not the entanglement because you can do that very easily. It's what, what comes after that, right? Like after you have this entanglement, right? The entanglement is still quite the challenge because how do you get photons to be entangled? You will, the, the way you get them to, in order to have photons entangle, they need to be, um, they need to somehow interact or they need to have somehow a common origin. And that's very challenging because photons normally just pass through each other. They don't interact. And so getting, getting this entanglement is very challenging. Um, and it's, it's so challenging. That's why people don't think about trying to do, you know, the, because photons are just whizzing about so quickly. Trying to do two qubit gates on them would be, um, it would just be extra challenging because the. How do you, you keep two photons, the photons there. in yeah. time? <laughs> exactly. And you would need to entangle them sort of on demand. Uh, that's what a two qubit gate does, is it, it gives you entanglement. And so the way people try to solve this problem is they say, all right, getting entanglement is very hard. Let's just do that at the beginning, make this big entangled state, and then do different operations to that. Mm -hmm. Cool. But, it's, uh, it's, it's very challenging, but the nice thing about it is that if you're able to solve these problems, scaling goes boom. You, you, may, you may be able to just all at once yeah. go from you know, zero 
to a million. Yeah, at least yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the hope. That's the hope. That's the hope of these select players we also have uh, there in the slide. Let's talk about this last type of quantum computers: uh, silicon spin quantum dots. In this case, they use the spin of electrons in semiconductors as qubits. And this year, uh, we got a demonstration um, that they can produce, uh, they can do mass production of qubits using standard processes uh, that we already use in manufacturing uh, of silicon technology. Um, and basically, good thing is that we can scale up these processes. Uh, we already have a very scaled up uh, silicon technology out there for other purposes. And they also have a strong gate fidelities and speeds. Problem is that again, we need like very low temperatures uh, to do this. Um, they also have are facing some challenges in, uh, challenges regarding interferences, uh, crosstalks, and very few useful entangled gates to date. However, we have very important players uh, trying to push this technology as well. Uh, any thoughts about uh, silicon spin, uh, quantum dots, um, quantum computers? Yeah, so the this, the the silicon spin um, quantum computers may have some of the same advantages as the photonic quantum computers in that you can take advantage of the silicon industry, so silicon photonics in the case of the photonic quantum computers, which is already very advanced, right? It's already it, very advanced, yeah, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly, and so. You would, when it comes to thinking about scale, um, you know, though you would want to, you would want to try and take advantage of those processes if possible. Otherwise, you have to come up with a new scaling strategy from scratch. And so, it is one of the nice uh, potential advantages of something like a quantum dot um, computer. And quantum dots also, there's a there's a larger industry out there of quant of applications of quantum dots besides quantum computing. And so, this idea of you know, manufacturability uh, could be could be an interesting advantage just because there's going to be reasons for people to want to do quantum dots at scale um, and the same kinds of uh, th those same kinds of manufacturing processes or at least very similar ones um, will happen anyway. One of these uh, cool quantum mechanical properties is quantum entanglement. What is exactly quantum entanglement, Stefan? Yeah, quantum entanglement is, I mean, in some ways, entanglement is like the quantum property. It's very, it's a uh, very interesting and it's one that, you know, you read a lot about uh, in the popular press mm -hmm. as well. Quantum entanglement, in the simplest case, you can talk about the entanglement of, say, two, two quantum particles or two quantum systems or two qubits, mm -hmm. right? And what it means for, say, these two qubits to be entangled means that even if they're, you know, they're far apart from each other, uh, if you look at if you look at one of them and you measure the result of one of them by taking a look at it, is it a zero? Mm -hmm. Is it a one? And, and you look at the other one completely separately, is it a zero or is it a one? You won't be able to predict beforehand whether it's zero or one. But if you were to measure these qubits, you would find that the answers are correlated, right? If you get a one over here, you get a one over here. If you get a zero over here, you get a zero over here. But you won't be able to say. So wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a and second. That's so the, you are saying that a qubit that is in um, Palo Alto, California, and another one in Osaka, Japan, will be somehow connected that way, even if they are that far. That's right. That's right. And it's it's less it's less it's less mysterious or less crazy than it sounds because these qubits they were not always far apart. Uh, in order to entangle them, you need to bring them together and or have some kind of communication between them in order to set up the entanglement. But once it's set up, once the entanglement is set up, then there will be this correlation between their measurement outcomes, which is uh, which can be taken advantage of. And furthermore, there are other kinds of very interesting as that's only one aspect of entanglement. You can you can also do operations to these qubits in different ways. And the effect of making an operation on one qubit is somehow the same total effect as making an operate, making a perhaps different operation on the other qubit. And it gets, it gets complicated very quickly. One thing I do want to say, though, about entanglement, despite the fact that the way we talk about it makes it sound this way, entanglement between qubits does not imply 
that there's any kind of instantaneous communication faster than light, say, between the mm -hmm. qubits. That's something it doesn't do. But it gets right up to the edge of being able to do instantaneous communication without being able to do instantaneous communication. Some of it, some of the effects of entanglement seem miraculous and seem like they shouldn't be possible without instantaneous communication. But trust me, <laughs> it's not actually instant. It's not actually doing faster than light communication, but it's still, it still allows for very Super cool, cool. Okay, let's move on. We talked uh, briefly about it before, but I guess people want to understand what are the advantages in quantum computers versus uh, classical supercomputers, let's say, right? Because people can say, we already have supercomputers out there. Why do we need quantum computers for? Like, what exactly for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, quantum computers, there are certain things that quantum computers can do very well. And by very well, I mean in, in a way that's sometimes exponentially better than a classical computer. So there may be problems that you try to solve, which are um, effectively impossible for a classical computer and only possible for a quantum computer. Even if so it is, even if you put together all the supercomputers in the world, they wouldn't be able to solve some issues that quantum computers exactly. can solve, right? Exactly, exactly. So when people say you have an exponential advantage, this is sort of a key word that people often use because, you know, when you're being careful about it, you don't like to say words like possible or impossible. You instead, you because, okay, in principle, maybe it's possible. But, you know, this in principle possibility means taking a computer, you know, much larger than all putting together all the computers. If you turned every everything, up, if you turn the whole earth all of the materials on the earth and you converted them into a computer and then you had that computer run for the age of the universe, it still wouldn't finish. Um, but a quantum computer could do the calculation in a reasonable amount of time. That's like an exponential. That's what exponential advantage means. It means that kind of difference. And we were, we were talking before about like what type of problems uh, could, could we solve? And uh, uh, people often talk about simulations People often talk about very large, very complex optimization problems. For example, if you want, if you want to find the optimal routes for thousands and thousands of tracks or planes in a, in a global shipping network, that will be a very large and complex optimization program, uh, problem, but also in machine learning. Uh, why, why these three uh, in particular? Why, why, does three, why these three topics in particular uh, we think will be uh, useful to have uh, quantum computers for. Yeah. So in the case of, you know, the modeling of behavior of atoms and molecules, that is an inherently quantum kind of problem. The reason why it's very complex is because the problem itself is quantum mechanical. Because we have uh, subatomic particles exactly, behaving because, uh, in a exactly. like, quote, subatomic unquote, particles, quantum mechanical way. Right. They're behaving in a quantum mechanical way. And, you know, we think of it as a very complex problem because we try to solve the quantum mechanical nature of it without using a quantum computer. But if you had a quantum computer, then it might be very easy because the quantum computer is just doing that. And so that's one very clear area where a quantum computer could make sense. In these other areas like optimization and maybe some kinds of machine learning, yes, these are cases where there's, you know, big data and any kind of shortcut you can get for analyzing that big data. Um, would be extremely useful or looking at, you know, you've got a large spectrum of possibilities and you don't know which of these possibilities is the right one, which is the one you should choose. There are ideas for how to use quantum computers to help make that choice in a more efficient way. Is it going to be one of these gigantic exponential advantages? Maybe, maybe not, it, but it could still be uh, a, a kind of a smaller but still significant advantage using a quantum computer for those kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in a short way, we, we should say that quantum computers are built for complexity. There is a lot of hype out there, but we need to understand that quantum computers are built for complexity to solve very, very complex problems. That's right. That's okay. right. And if you look at the activity that people are undergoing in the quantum computing space right now, you've got lots of people out there experimenting 
with quantum computers and with you know simulations of quantum computers trying to figure out which problems are really the best problems for quantum computers. There's a you know one of the points that I think is important to make is that trying to knowing exactly what a quantum computer can and can't do and which exact problems are the ones that are good for quantum and not good for quantum it's a very challenging thing to do when you don't have the quantum computer right i mean no one would have guessed um you know 50 years ago what people are doing today with ordinary computers Absolutely. despite the fact that yeah. 50 years ago people knew what ordinary computers were but until you have the computer and you can experiment with it and iterate and find new ways to use it um, you're going to be limited in your ability to predict what the best thing is. Absolutely. What we do know is that there's a lot of potential. No one could predict, I don't know, uh, Netflix or exactly. yeah, dating apps or things like that. So 